now again move to topical questions. I want to say to the House that Pat Sheegan has withdrawn his name, which was listed at question number seven. Let us now move to topical questions to the Social Development Minister, and I call Trevor Lunn. Mr Lunn. Yes, thank you. Mr Speaker, uh, we're at the start of a new session, and I hope that the question of of major legislation held over from the last session is sufficiently topical. So could I ask the Minister to give us whatever update he can on the, the question of the Welfare Reform Bill? Um, yes, indeed I can. Um, a lot of good work has been done in regard to the Welfare Reform Bill to ensure that we get uh, legislation that is best suited to the needs of Northern Ireland. Um, and I think we are in a much better place in that regard as the result of the negotiations that uh, I and, and uh, my officials have had with uh, officials across in GB and, and with the relevant ministers at Westminster. Um, there is uh, a factor here that needs to be kept in mind. Uh, there has been correspondence uh, from uh, Westminster, from the Treasury, in regard to the um, potential penalties. And, uh, we stray into an area here which might suggest that having the topical questions after the, the other questions might be a better uh, arrangement. But certainly uh, it has been made clear by the Treasury the potential uh, penalties that might arise. And uh, I would hope that we would be in a position to get the legislation through and have royal assent by the end of this year. Uh, if we do that, we are then, I think, in line with what is expected uh, from Westminster. Yes, I thank the Minister for his answer, and I certainly wasn't going to raise the question of penalties because it's coming up very shortly. But uh, can, can I ask him, can, is there any detail he can give us around whatever concessions and differentiations have been agreed or formalised between ourselves and the UK in terms of the different situation here in Northern Ireland? Um, on a number of occasions, I've identified uh, three core issues which were raised right at the start um, by myself. And, and officials, and that was, of course, uh, in regard to um, the issue of uh, split payments, um, the issue of um, direct payments as well. Uh, th so there, there were several issues there at the start that we identified. The key thing then was to go beyond that, because I think we, we've secured those. That was a major achievement. It's one that is envied by people in Great Britain, um, but we have achieved those. Um, we're just making sure that all of those things are fitted into the um, complexities of the, the um, much debated um, computer system that is handling uh, welfare reform, and which has been much in the news. Uh, but we're, we're uh, confident about those. And then there are some additional matters. I don't want at this point, uh, until we've taken the matter through the executive, to comment any further. But there are other issues, certainly, that we uh, are determined to take forward to get the best outcome for Northern Ireland. Jim Allister. Mr. Allister. On the 4th of July, the minister told the DSD committee that he had no criticism at all of what his special adviser did in regard to his infamous phone call to Councillor Palmer. Has his special adviser since apologised? And if so, does the minister uh, now accept that Councillor Palmer told the truth about that phone call? Interesting use of the word infamous by the member who seems to prejudge things even before he has all the facts. I always think it's a good idea to wait until you get the facts before you make a determination on anything. And uh, I want to welcome the member uh, to the Social Development Committee. Hopefully uh, his presence there will make sure that he's better informed on some of these matters. I'm not party to any conversation that took place and I'm not aware of any apology being made. Well, as Minister, I assume you would expect to be aware, so we can assume there is no apology, but in something you might be aware of. Can you tell us, was any minister present, any minister present, when the particular phone call was made or the decision to make it was made? Um, all of these matters will be considered in due course by the uh, committee in inquiry that is due to take place. And I'm sure all of those will be uh, dealt with at that time, and the special advisor, I'm sure, will appear and will answer those questions at that point in time. Dolores Kelly. 
Mrs. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to explain his department's uh, removal of Fredericks, Frederick Street in uh, North Belfast from the Social Housing Development Programme? And could he assure the House further that this does not demonstrate a lack of ambition within his department to build uh, social housing and meet the needs uh, not only in Belfast but uh, across the North? Well, the, the member focused in on a particular site uh, adjacent to the University of Ulster, which is, of course, the biggest development that will be taking place in North Belfast and, indeed, in Belfast over uh, the next period of time. Uh, that particular piece of ground uh, that was mentioned uh, and uh, that which you referred actually belongs to uh, the Department for Regional Development through road service. Um, it is currently a car park. They have no intention of it being anything other than a car park. And therefore, um, I see little point in having something uh, in a programme which could never be realised because uh, the land is required for car parking. And there will be substantial car parking demands there, of course, in relation to uh, the, the University of Ulster and the thousands of students who will be coming there to the site. Um, if you look at the detailed social housing development record and the future programme for North Belfast, uh, that particular constituency has received a very large share, indeed the lion's share, of uh, social housing investment over the past uh, number of years. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Could the Minister confirm that there are at least three sites available for car parking to meet the needs of the University of Ulster? And can he not acknowledge the fact that, given the Department's decision in recent months in relation to Girdwood and the refusal of the Minister to build social housing where it is most needed on the basis of objective need, that uh, the perception in the community that, that, that the reasons for this decision are actually quite suspect indeed? Um, I would encourage the member to look a little more closely at housing delivery and housing demand in North Belfast, because I think the more that that is scrutinised and carefully scrutinised, I think it brings forward some uh, truths that perhaps have been rather buried in the past. Um, there has been uh, an extensive uh, programme of building. Uh, there will be significant more building uh, over the next uh, number of years. And I have to say, I'm not responsible for the um, car parking arrangements for the uh, university. Um, those are other matters. The, all of this is being, of course, taken forward by the university themselves. They are the people who made the planning application for the car park. Mr. Um, Miglo. Could I ask the Minister, uh, in light of the growing and pressurised demand that there is for social housing, um, particularly in my own area in Maharfelta and Cookstown. But what are his plans and the department's plans to prioritise additional funding to get those houses built? I think the priority is, first of all, to make sure that the money that has already been allocated to the housing executive for social house building and for the social housing development programme, that the money that has already been allocated is spent. We don't want to get into a situation, as has happened uh, in the recent past, where the housing executive come back later on in a year and say we can't spend all the money uh, that we've got. I want to ensure that every penny that has been uh, devoted by my department and by myself for social housing is actually spent. And that brings us to the issue of how uh, the uh, housing executive and the housing associations are performing. Uh, a lot more could be done. We should be much better in Northern Ireland uh, in terms of uh, delivery of social housing, but that is entirely dependent on uh, effective, efficient working by both the housing executive and the housing associations. And I would hope that uh, as we move forward with housing and make some of the changes uh, that I think are necessary in Northern Ireland, we will actually get a better delivery. Mr. McLean. Um, on that very point, um, and it's back to the department, what in actual fact is the department doing to make sure that the money that you had previously, indeed 15 million, which was previously handed back, that we don't have embarrassing situations like that, that projects are spade ready, and that people have the potential to have a roof over their heads because the waiting list is substantially growing? Well, it's always careful to, uh, important that you examine waiting lists carefully because there are many people who are on waiting lists who uh, can actually be on a housing waiting list in Northern Ireland uh, and be a homeowner, uh, which is a, a slightly odd situation when you actually have a house uh, and anybody can put their name down and there's no restrictions on that. Um, one of the things I have done, and it's the right thing to do, 
um, is to make sure that we meet regularly with the housing executive and with housing associations to get them to step up to the mark. Indeed, I spoke some time ago to the Federation of Housing Associations, saying that they needed to be more ambitious. I was pleased to have the opportunity of seeing what can be done by housing associations in Great Britain. Visited them recently with the Vice Chair of the Housing Executive. I encourage other members of the uh, members of the Social Development Committee here in the Assembly to actually do the same thing. Go and see what's actually happening there and how dynamic some of those associations are. Whereas we have, uh, whatever the figure is exactly, I'm not sure, because it changes uh, through amalgamations, etc. But somewhere just under 30 housing associations in Northern Ireland, only about half a dozen of them are actually building, uh, and, and the bulk of the building is by a, a handful. That is a situation that needs change. We need a more dynamic sector. Robin Swan. Mr Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Minister, the Facing the Future Housing Strategy for Northern Ireland contains a p- proposal to pilot in four areas a housing-led approach to the regeneration of communities experienced blight, dereliction and decline. The Dury Road in my own constituency in North Antrim was one of those areas. Can the Minister confirm that this project is going ahead and that it is not being delayed by the request from Sinn Féin to add a fifth area? Um, I took the opportunity, having brought forward the proposal for housing-led regeneration, which was uh, an initiative uh, from myself uh, and uh, from, from the Department. I brought forward that proposal. We then uh, went out and advertised, in a sense, uh, and made known and publicised um, that, that new programme, which is good practice elsewhere in the United Kingdom, but has been so far never implemented here in Northern Ireland. Housing ed regeneration is simply just good practice. I took the opportunity of visiting four areas where um, people have expressed an interest in this, and Dury Road indeed was one of them. Um, and I met there with local representatives and with local residents. Um, we are now assessing all of the potential areas that we could look at on the basis of set criteria. And once those have been finalised, an uh, announcement will be made uh, fairly soon as to the um, final set of areas that are to be taken forward under this. But when you look at Dury Road, it certainly ticks all the boxes. Minister, the question I actually asked was of the four areas. Can you, de- can you confirm if this process has been de- delayed by the Sinn Féin request to add a fifth area? And if it's not, can you give us a timeline as to where the Derry Road will actually attain the funds? I said there that we were applying the criteria that is happening. Uh, I said that the announcement would be made within a, a few weeks. Um, and this has not been delayed. It's simply being done properly, uh, as you would expect it to be done. We will have the announcement in a few weeks of the areas that are going to be taken forward. And I told the folk that day when I was up in Dury Road, and I think they were quite pleased with that, that um, quite satisfied, this will be taken forward very quickly. Um, it will be within a matter of weeks. And when you look at the criteria, Dury Road certainly ticks the boxes. McCurley. Um, can I ask the Minister what efforts is he taking to reduce sectarian tensions and to have the Loyalist camp at Ardoin removed? The situation there at um, Ardoin is a certainly a difficult one. Um, there is a long term piece of work to be done there, no doubt about that, in terms of Um, building better relationships and um, reducing difficulties at that particular location. Um, The presence of um, uh, a loyalist uh, unionist camp there at uh, that site is not the only factor that is feeding into difficulties there. I think that the uh, past number of years, indeed for quite a number of years, uh, many years, there has been difficulty in that site. It is not something new that has suddenly appeared out of space. It has been there a very long time. So, for example, if you go back to last year, we had distant Republican gunman trying to murder police officers at that point. So there have been difficulties there for quite some time, and um, I want to see them uh, resolved. There are various things we are doing, but I do not think that uh, uh, they are things that necessarily are going to produce immediate results. This is a long-term thing. It has been there for a long time. Members, that ends uh, topical questions uh, to the Minister. We move on now to oral questions. The Minister is relevant. And I call John Dallin. Mr. Dallin. Mr. Speaker, Kester Everheen, question number one. 
Um, with the Speaker's permission, I will answer questions 1 and 14 together, as uh, both questions relate to the wider issue of uh, fuel poverty. The fuel poverty strategy was launched in April 2011, Warmer, Healthier Homes. It sets out our vision for the future as a society in which people live in a warm, comfortable home and don't need to worry about the effect of the cold on their health. Uh, my department delivers uh, a number of schemes which can help householders heat their homes more efficiently, such as warm homes and the boiler replacement scheme. The warm homes scheme continues to be our primary tool in tackle fuel poverty, with an average target an annual target of installing energy efficiency improvements in 9,000 homes. We have been meeting the target consistently since 2009, providing a range of measures making homes warmer, healthier and more energy efficient. The boiler replacement scheme was launched in September 2012 and has been hugely successful. It offers an allowance towards the cost of replacing old inefficient boilers to householders where the annual gross uh, income is less than £40,000. The scheme aims to assist 16,000 households to replace their old inefficient boilers over three years, with an average uh, three-bedroom semi-detached house saving in excess of £2,700 over the 10-year period. And that figure increases the older the, the boiler is. Um, there are two other elements for tackling fuel poverty. Last year, in response to high oil prices, um, we did some work around um, a pilot pay-as-you-go scheme. Uh, it was done for three months. It was evaluated. Um, there are, however, two crucial issues around the cost and delivery of introducing a pay-as-you-go uh, system into the mainstream energy strategy. Those two issues are around um, the cost associated with production and administration. Um, we have had meetings about this. We are looking at pay-as-you-go uh, and plan um, so are being awaited for a new business case, taking into consideration the issues that were highlighted uh, to them. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the sure Minister for, for, for his answer. And given the high levels of uh, fuel poverty that he has spoken about, which certainly has not reached this building, not today anyway, can the Minister assure us that live applications for replacement boilers will in fact be processed before the onset of the winter? Well, the processing of applications is an ongoing process. And there um, are constantly applications coming in and uh, applications being approved and signed off. Um, so at any point in time, people are at different stages. Um, therefore, uh, it is uh, not a question that uh, lends itself to a ready answer because of the nature of, of the process. However, um, I can say that uh, if uh, applications are coming in, they are being dealt with as quickly as the housing executive can possibly deal with them. Um, thank the Minister for his answer so far. In relationship to pay as you go, what are the main issues around costs? The original costings that were uh, brought forward proved too expensive, with estimation of the production and the administration of the pay as you go oil system in the range of four hundred to six hundred and fifty pounds per unit. If the department was to support a scheme that uh, will um, bulk by around 900 litres for 10,000 households at a cost of £5 million from a single oil supplier. This might lead to accusations of market interference and distortion. Um, however, local job creation will not be uh, significant as the pay-as-you-go units are manufactured in China. Fry McCann. Mr McCann. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, I think the, the, the Minister knows that there are quite a number of people who live in relatively new houses uh, that during the building process uh, had insulation excluded from uh, the, the, the build. Uh, could he tell us uh, what has been done uh, to help and assist those people uh, rectify this problem? Um, I have met with people in that regard, um, residents of a particular estate where that was a, a problem. Um, I, there are limits to what can be done in the case of private ownership. There is an onus on private owners um, when they're buying a property to, to take due care, but I can understand it's virtually impossible for an individual to, uh, you're not going to gain access to a cavity in a wall to find out uh, the state of the insulation uh, in that particular case. I'll just say this to the member. The issue of um, a lack of, cal of cavity wall insulation is certainly not an issue just for the, for the um, people in the private uh, sector. There are thousands of people in um, social housing 
who have no um, Cavalry Wall uh, because the houses were built without Cavalry Wall. That's an issue that uh, has been around for many years. It's been concealed and hidden in the past, I would suggest, because uh, I know one estate where for a period of 10 years this has been raised. Nothing was really done about it other than a little bit of patching here and there. Um, we have now engaged fully with the housing executive. I went to see again uh, across in, in Liverpool how houses were being dealt with to retrofit them to deal with that issue. And um, there's some good work ongoing at present with the executive as to how in the longer term we'll be able to deal over a period of time with those properties, thousands of them across Northern Ireland where social houses uh, um, are, are lacking and they're there for, are lacking insulation and therefore are cold, they're hard to heat. Um, people are, are suffering in terms of uh, fuel poverty. And not only are they cold, but in many cases they can be damp as well. Um, sometimes people are being flogged off and told it was condensation. It certainly wasn't condensation in many of the cases. But I think we're actually in a much better place. I've made it a priority. I recognise there was a problem, made it a priority, and we're taking that forward as quickly as we possibly can. Mr. Copeland. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I would ask the Minister if he is aware of the situation where very many socially owned properties are on paper possessed of cavity wall insulation, but it's of a fibre type which was fitted some time ago. And because of condensation, damp and moisture, it is now all sunk down to the bottom and effectively the properties are sitting in a damp band about three feet high around the bottom. And is he taking any steps to remedy that? Um, the Housing Executive is doing a survey of all of its properties to see what uh, needs to be done in, in regard to um, energy efficiency. So that's a piece of work taken across uh, their entire stock. Um, I focused there particularly on those that didn't have any cavity at all in the first place, but the member is right to identify others where there has been a deterioration of the um, insulation that was installed quite a number of years ago. The work that's been done by the executive in terms of assessing their properties um, and getting, the, uh, getting that report finished will, will inform much better what can be done. I think um, th there's work that certainly needs to be done with all of those. People living in um, a housing executive property. It's not so much a, a housing association property issue because their properties tend to be much newer. But certainly the housing executive properties, um, they, um, there, there's certainly a need to, uh, to get those up to the standard. Um, I think we've got the resources to do that. It's a matter of making it happen. And uh, I can assure the member we are pressing on with that as quickly as possible. I had a meeting with the executive, uh, with the chair uh, recently and got an update on where we are with that. Sandra Oberlein. Mrs Oberlein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two, please. I previously outlined to the Assembly how Social Security benefits in Northern Ireland are funded and the conditions which underpin that funding. In the year 2012-13, over £5 billion of funding was provided by Her Majesty's Treasury to cover the cost of Social Security spending in Northern Ireland. This funding is in addition to the Northern Ireland Block Grant and is provided on the basis that there is parity between the social security systems in Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. That's also, by the way, the practical outworking of the provisions within the Northern Ireland Act, which commits us to maintain a single system of social security. In making the funding available for social security spending, the Treasury is carrying all the risk with regard to any potential increases in social security spending. They are therefore concerned that Northern Ireland has not yet implemented welfare reform at a time when social security spending has been identified as one of the key levers on the coalition government's approach to controlling UK public finances and controlling the fiscal deficit. I previously updated the Assembly on the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions letter of May 2012, which outlined that any delay in passing the Welfare Reform Bill will increase the cost to the Treasury and that the UK Government is entitled to recover these costs through an adjustment to the Northern Ireland Bloc Grant. On 1 July 2013, Minister for Finance and Personnel advised the Assembly of recent correspondence from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, which made clear that if the Executive does not implement relevant welfare reforms by January 2014, the Northern Ireland Bloc will be adjusted. Uh, the Minister made clear the costs are potentially huge and unaffordable for the Northern Ireland Bloc, with the Chief Secretary's estimated cost for delays incurred in this year as some £5 million per month and up to £200 million per year by 2017-18. Officials continue to engage with the Treasury to ensure that we protect the interests of Northern Ireland and get the best deal for citizens. However, at the most recent reading with the Treasury on the 4th of September, Treasury officials reiterated their position 
that failure to implement relevant welfare reforms by January 2014 will result in the Northern Ireland bloc being adjusted. It's therefore essential that we take all the necessary steps to avoid incurring those penalties and progress the legislation as a key priority. Sandra O'Brien. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister um, for that detail. It was last October when the Minister was uh, scaremongering about time running out, and indeed the, the current Finance Minister in the same debate said that time had already run out. Uh, does the Minister now agree with me that his claims were ill-informed and that the reason why there was no penalty is because the introduction of the reforms in England uh, has been so chaotic rather than negotiation skills maybe that he might have? Well, I think if the member had listened to the answer that I gave, had actually listened and understood what I said, I referred to correspondence on two occasions and clear in writing requirements there and uh, warnings that have been given. So our use of the word scaremongering I regard as absolutely uh, incredible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the answers you've given so far. Can I ask the Minister whether there's any warnings on this issue in the past? The Secretary of State for Work and Pensions wrote to me in May 2012 indicating that the delay in passing the Northern Ireland legislation would incur costs to the Exchequer and that the UK Government is entitled to seek to recover these costs through an adjustment to the block grant. Fundamentally, the agreement that funds Northern Ireland Social Security spending directly from the Treasury on the basis of need conditions that Northern Ireland's spending will only be met if we maintain the same systems, and that's outlined in what's called the Statement of Funding Policy. More recently, in July 2013, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury wrote to the Finance Minister advising that it was imperative that uh, the welfare reform legislation was dealt with by January 2014, and that was reiterated, as I've said, on the 4th of September. So the point has been made absolutely clear on three occasions there about the difficulties we would face if we don't take this forward. And that's why uh, I was so dismissive of any talks of scaremongering. Those are real concerns. Brady. Mr. Brady. Gormay, I got the Concordia. Could I ask the Minister, is he concerned that reports emanating from Britain would indicate that since the introduction of benefit cuts, many major problems are being caused in communities there? And also, a government audit report published last week indicates that the introduction of universal credit may not be at all feasible, and already £38 million has been written off in uh, IT costs. Uh, I had the opportunity of going over uh, some time ago to see some of the work being done on the design of the original system, uh, and uh, it was quite uh, an incredible operation. Uh, it doesn't seem to have worked very effectively uh, in view of what has emerged. So um, that, I'm glad to say also that's not an issue that, over which I am, have any responsibility because whoever has responsibility for dealing with the development of the, uh, the IT system, uh, uh, it's certainly, it's one of the, it is really the biggest IT operation anywhere, I think, probably in the world at the moment yeah. that's been taken forward. Um, and people are bound to be concerned about that. Uh, and what the impact of it will be. As regards the impact of um, the various changes that are coming in um, and are being gradually phased in in GB, information about the impact is, is emerging as time goes on. And it's something we will monitor very closely. But the key thing to remember is what will happen here is not exactly the same as what's going to happen or has happened across the water. We are tailoring it to make sure we get the best outcome for Northern Ireland. And I'm uh, working closely with the uh, Executive Subcommittee and with the DSK Committee in that regard will want to make sure that we get a good outcome. Ray Campbell. Mr. Campbell. Number three, Mr. Speaker. The Housing Executive currently has 1,887 void properties across Northern Ireland. This consists of 197 properties which will be relet imminently. 348 difficult to let properties which the executive will continue to offer to housing applicants, 650 properties which are undergoing major repairs uh, that will be made available for letting when the works are complete, 117 properties where sales are pending, 539 properties where demolition is pending and 39 properties classified as subject to sped or occupied by squatters. Uh, should the member wish, I would be happy to provide him with a breakdown of vacant housing executive properties um, by region. 
can I thank the Minister for the work he's doing in relation to vacant properties, but he, he will be aware that I had raised with him over a number of years the uh, number of properties in Ballysally Estate and Coleraine that have been derelict for quite con some considerable time, uh, and I've met the housing association that uh, hopes to renovate and refurbish them. Has any update that he can give the House in respect of that refurbishment? Um, I share the member's concern about Ballysally because uh, the derelict properties there which were used so much by uh, a documentary uh, filmmaker in regard to a programme about the estate and focused very much on that and missed all the good things that are happening in the estate. Um, nevertheless, it is clear when you go up there that this is a blight on the area. And, um, I went up and saw the poor condition of the houses that were previously owned by Shack um, Housing Association, heard at first hand the effect on tenants. Uh, and I instructed, therefore, that work be progressed as a matter of urgency to bring these properties back into use. Oakley Housing Association, who now own the properties, have advised that they intend to tender for work to refurbish the first 10 properties this week with a view to commencing work on site by November. Now, subject to sufficient demand for housing, work on the next 10 properties will commence immediately afterwards. Mr. Maskey. Could I ask the Minister first of all thank him for his response so far on the work that has been done on this matter, but could he ask the Minister that, uh, I mean, as I understand it, there are a number of, uh, like for example, newly allocated homes uh, that people are unable to be, uh, have the necessary repairs carried out due to some of the problems associated with recent uh, maintenance contracts. Uh, can the Minister first of all confirm if that is the case, and if so, what is uh, being done to make sure that people who have been allocated tenancies can actually take them up as quickly as possible? Um, certainly, the difficulties that there have been regarding housing side of contractors have created problems there uh, and created a backlog of work in, in a number of areas. Um, and the, the demise of certain companies has an effect on uh, the employees, but also has a major impact on tenants in that they're not getting the standard of service uh, that they should be getting. Um, I understand that on the 28th of August, the um, housing executive um, was looking at some of these issues around contracts. Um, some of the work, I think, may become uh, direct labour organisation work and whatever. The arrangements regarding those particular uh, contracts, I haven't had sight of the final outcome. Um, regarding who will be doing the, the work uh, with the contracts, but um, th I think the executive has been made uh, well aware of the concerns that we have and the need to get the backlog cleared up so that people are not left in a difficult situation or unable to move into a house uh, uh, that they've been allocated, as the member um, suggests is happening. It certainly is an issue there. It is being addressed, but it will take a little while to deal with that backlog. Bradley, Mr. Bradley. Um, can I ask the Minister if he can clarify the advice given by the Housing Executive to regional Housing Executive uh, offices uh, with regard to housing transfers? Um, the position in regard to that, I understand, uh, was also dealt with at the uh, executives board meeting on the 28th of August. Um, they are looking at a way in which they can um, address the difficulty that was created by the situation uh, or by the determination by the, the judge in the judicial review. Um, certainly what happened in regard to St Matthews Housing Association um, is a matter of public record and, and public concern. Um, it is being looked into. Um, and there was some hold on that during the judicial review, but that uh, research, that investigation is now uh, continuing. Um, but I think that the executive indicated to me, at a, I was discussing it actually at a meeting with the executive this morning, and they indicated to me that whilst they didn't have, weren't able to give me the details at the meeting this morning, that the matter was dealt with on the 28th of August, and that uh, they have a way forward which they think will um, address the issue. Because uh, I'm well aware, I'm sure the member is as well in his own case, of people who were uh, virtually ready with a key in their hand to put it into the door and move into a house, and then the transfer has been halted. So it's been a very unfortunate situation, but one that they feel they can get uh, redressed and resolved. Sean Lynch.
Um, I am committed to working with a range of partners both within and outside government to improve incomes and to alleviate poverty, including fuel poverty. And low income is, of course, one of the key factors associated with fuel poverty. My Department's work on improving uptake of benefits has produced £50 million in additional income for more than 15,000 people since 2005. And, um, the last year, the results were uh, extremely good. Uh, the uptake trebled uh, with £13.1 million in new annual income shared by 4,000 people, mainly aged 60 and over. Um, in 3rd of July, I launched Maximising Incomes and Outcomes, a three-year plan for improving the uptake of benefits, which sets out six strategic priorities for action and a wide range of approaches. And over the next uh, three years, my department will work across government and with increasing numbers of third sector partners to ensure that a minimum of £30 million in new additional benefits is generated for at least 10,000 uh, people. I am glad other departments are following our lead, and I welcome the contribution that they are now making by working with my department in addressing fuel poverty in rural areas. Um, my department is also conducting an affordable warmth pilot, working with local councils, the housing executive, etc., to find those homes which are suffering the worst effects of fuel poverty. And, uh, the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development has been involved in providing funding for hard-to-heat uh, properties identified during the pilot. My department provides energy efficiency assistance to vulnerable households through the Warm Homes Scheme, and that stipulates that 40 per cent of measures delivered must be for homes in rural areas. Since 2011, 12,500 rural homes have received heating and or insulation through the programme, and DARD contributes to the Warm Homes Scheme with additional money to provide a top-up grant for hard-to-treat uh, homes. Uh, in 2012-13, 430 rural homes uh, benefited from this uh, collaborative working. Uh, there are many people in rural homes who apply for the boiler replacement grant, and they have the option of switching from oil to a renewable energy source. However, the scheme shows very low uh, take-up of this option, with only two applications for this type of boiler out of a total of approximately 12,000 approvals for replacement boilers which have been uh, approved. In addition, as a key element of maximising incomes and outcomes, a three-year plan for improving benefit uptake uh, also uh, continues to work in partnership with the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development in addressing rural poverty through the Maximising Access in Rural Areas, or the MARA project as it is known, and that will run to 2015. Home visits are carried out by contracted local community-based facilitators to rural homes in areas deemed to be disadvantaged using a range of socio-economic indicators. Many people uh, have got a full benefit check by the Make the Call Benefit Advice Team. And to date, 2,772 benefit entitlement checks have been carried out with potential entitlement identified for 828. That's 30 per cent of people living in the rural areas and at risk of poverty. So more than 100 people to date have benefited from over £300,000 in new and additional um, annual income. Order, uh, order. I normally don't like to, to, to enter, I suppose, interject with ministers, especially when they're full flow, but just to remind the minister of the two-minute rule. John Lynch. Dead can call you and go and wake us like an error on Fragra. And uh, as you said yourself, it was a fairly de detailed uh, answer, and I want to thank him. Um, as the Minister is aware, the Warm Home Scheme is often very uh, urban uh, focused. Has he any plans to extend it to more rural areas? Good. Thank you. I apologise, first of all, to the Speaker. I just, uh, we're, we're doing so much in this area. It was very difficult to cram it, even part of it, into two minutes, and you understand that. But uh, I would just assure the member that the, the Warm Home Scheme stipulates 40 per cent of measures delivered must be in homes in rural areas. So there is a, a set focus there on, um, on rural areas, and that, that will continue. Jonathan Craig. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could the minister outline what other uh, avenues his department is taking to tackle rural, uh, wider poverty issues in rural areas. And could the minister maybe give a, a promise that some of this will actually be done in my own Lagan Valley constituency, which has huge rural area attached to it? Um, thank the member for his question. I can assure him that indeed 
Lion Valley will not be forgotten. Um, my department is also uh, committed to taking um, improving benefit uptake approaches out into the community. Um, maximising incomes and outcomes, community roadshow events will be delivered in every council area in Northern Ireland over the next three years, including Lisburn and all the other council areas that make up Lagan Valley. So it will certainly not be overlooked. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank the Minister for particularly the first marathon answer there. But uh, the, the latest Home Energy Conservation Authority annual report indicated that uh, households in fuel poverty had only been reduced from 44 to 42 per cent. Does the Minister believe that that is enough or acceptable, or what other measures are, is he planning to take to actually reduce that further? Um, certainly the level of fuel poverty in Northern Ireland, of course this is relative fuel poverty, which is one of the, one of the issues um, that needs to be kept in mind. Um, the, the level of fuel poverty did reduce by 2 per cent there. Um, there are factors that contribute to fuel poverty that um, come within the remit of my own department, so increasing income by benefit uptake, uh, warm homes, etc. These are things that we can um, do to um, reduce fuel poverty. Um, however, we are taking a, a new uh, and more focused area approach to it. Professor Christine Adele has been working with the department um, intensively, uh, bringing a, 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 a sound um, evidence-based approach to it. Um, and that is actually saying what you need to do is really identify those who are in greatest levels of fuel poverty, rather than simply trying to cater for everything, because you can't, it would be impossible with figures over 40 per cent. You deal with those who have the greatest problems, and that, her work is focused in, in that regard. Um, the schemes that we have brought forward of warm homes and, and the boiler replacement have been very good, very much appreciated. Um, there's hardly a week goes by, but I, I don't bump into people who say how much they value the scheme, the, the, the boiler replacement scheme. But certainly, um, there is more that can be done. The, the other issues fall within uh, the remit of other ministers, um, and the uh, announcement by um, your um, Fermanagh and Westrone um, colleague there, uh, the Minister Arlene Foster, uh, in relation to the extension of the gas network will make a difference. We are so heavily dependent on oil here in Northern Ireland, that is not a good place to be, it is not the best place to be. And, uh, her work in that regard, I am sure, will be appreciated by all of your constituents in that constituency and elsewhere. Kelly, Mrs. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I trust the Minister will have noted that it should have read Banbridge Council transfer uh, to. <laughs> That's taking the first bit out of my answer because, uh, Mr. Speaker, I was going to kind of, uh, point out that uh, Mrs. Kelly had got the wrong council area. I understand the Housing Centre advised Banbridge on the District Council on the 6th of August that it was willing to proceed with the freehold transfer of land at Lawrence Town to facilitate a community play area. In accordance with the requirements of managing public money in Northern Ireland, the housing centre is required to complete an economic appraisal for the transfer of the site. An economic appraisal is currently being drafted and is expected to be considered for approval by the housing executive later this month. Subject to the necessary approvals, the executive could provide the council with a letter of comfort to commence construction of the play area, followed shortly by formal transfer, subject to completion of legal formalities. I thank uh, the Minister for those comments and that any intervention that he has made because uh, it, it is money that has to be spent by the end of March of next year. <laughs> but uh, I, I wonder, is the Minister aware that the officer who was responsible, I understand, only works two days and are there other? Uh, uh, is the Minister confident that any other land transfer issues actually are being dealed, uh, dealt with uh, as swiftly as they could otherwise be? There are many different factors that uh, impact on land transfers. I'm not aware of the detailed uh, staffing arrangements in any particular office and wouldn't want to in any way suggest, I'm sure she is neither, that uh, that's something that um, impacted in this particular occasion. But there are factors that, that uh, do contribute and it can be on the part of a range of, of um, stakeholders. So um, we certainly um, will we'll do what we can when we're made aware of particular problems and I uh, can assure of that. Members, that concludes question time.